It's almost there. Almost there. And here we go. Type 1A Supernova. Hello wonderful person, today we're going to be talking about a somewhat unusual type 1A supernova. A type of a supernova that we're very familiar with. We've actually studied a lot of them, and we depend on them, mostly for measuring distances. So let's discuss this very unusual discovery of a supernova really far away, and what made it so unusual. But more specifically, let's talk about how all of this might affect our understanding of the universe. So let's begin with, what exactly are these type 1A supernova? Although I'm sure a lot of you already know the answer to this. In a nutshell though, stars like the nearby Sirius B that you see right here, which are known as the White Dwarfs, occasionally reach the limit of their existence. In other words, all White Dwarfs have a limit to their total mass, and if they somehow get that extra mass from somewhere else, they'll usually, though not always as we've observed in the past, will go supernova and create these very beautiful, very bright explosions. And for the most part, because this mass is roughly around 1.4 masses of the Sun, the total brightness of every one of these supernova is going to be roughly around the same. And because the brightness of these objects is very similar, we can actually use these to establish distances across the universe. And so this makes these supernova a type of a space candle, essentially a candle we can use to measure distances. Now this is how we know that the universe is expanding today, this is also how we know that the universe is accelerating its expansion, so our understanding of the universe itself actually depends on what we know about these supernova specifically. But then, once in a while we find something that doesn't really meet these expectations, at least to some extent. And this is just one such supernova. What the scientists were observing in this case, around this object known as LSQ-14 FMG, started as an extremely unusual explosion, extremely unusual in terms of luminosity, eventually becoming the brightest type 1a supernova we've actually ever seen. Making this a type of a super Chandrasekhar supernova, as the scientists refer to it, because, well, first of all, the reasons for the existence of the supernova is probably because it crossed its so-called Chandrasekhar limit, which is actually exactly what's happening here. Once enough mass is provided to a white dwarf and once its mass crosses a certain barrier, it's going to explode, it just can no longer sustain itself. Although if you're not sure about the reasons behind this, check out one of the previous videos that should be popping up somewhere along the top of the video there. Anyway, so these Super Chandrasekhar Supernova generally still have relatively similar luminosity, but as you can see this one was quite significantly brighter. And even stranger than that, it seems to have reached this brightness over a very very long period of time compared to some of the other supernova. More specifically, unlike a typical supernova that only takes about a week to reach its top brightness, this one took almost a month. And when it was at its brightest, it was brighter than anything we've seen so far. So this is a very strange occurrence and, well first of all obviously puts a bit of a dent on our understanding of how type 1a supernova are created, but also creates a bit of a difficulty for us when it comes to measuring distances in space. Because if a lot of these supernova are like that, well, that means that we might have measured things incorrectly. But luckily, this is probably a very rare event. And the reason we think so is because of where this occurred, according to the scientists. Having analyzed this in more detail, they realized that this is actually a very unusual event, but also a very interesting event. So what they think happened here, based on the observations of the luminosity and various materials produced, can be described as a supernova happening inside a very large star. So I tried to recreate this using this simulation just to help you visualize all of this. Here what you're looking at is essentially a very ancient star, kind of similar to our sun but probably a little bit more massive. This here is the outer shell of the star that's been slowly expanding and moving away from the center. Generally, this type of a star is referred to as AGB or Asymptotic Giant Branch Star, which in a nutshell just refers to how stars evolve along this graph that you see that was created a long time ago. In more layman terms, it refers to the time in a star's life right before it becomes a planetary nebula and leaves behind a very dense white dwarf in the middle but also right after it goes through its giant stage. So that's kind of like the transition period before the star sort of throws off its outer layer, which I try to simulate right here by creating this layer and the core in the middle. 
But the thing is, this star itself has another star inside. Which is why here you see two different cores. One is a white dwarf from a um, slightly older star that already went through its AGB stage a long time ago, and one is the core of the current star. In terms of the appearance and in terms of the uh, parameters, they're probably not exactly the same, but they're similar enough. And as you can imagine, these two cores are orbiting around one another, just like the stars used to orbit around one another a long time ago. But obviously, because this is happening inside of the actual star, inside the AGB, the orbits here are slowly decreasing simply because as these stars orbit around one another, the friction from all of the material slowly decreases their speed, and because of this, they're slowly getting closer and closer to one another. And you can probably imagine that at some point, once they get close enough together, they will probably combine. And upon combining, they will probably reach the so-called Super Chandrasekhar limit. In other words, the total mass here is going to be over the allowed mass for a typical white dwarf. And by the way, these cores of stars in general, that's essentially what produces the white dwarfs to begin with. And as soon as they combine, they go supernova. But because the previous star was throwing off so much material in the past, the supernova itself is not going to be very bright right away. It's going to increase its brightness much slower. And by the way, in case you ever wondered what creates the brightness in a supernova to begin with, it all has to do with a burning of a very specific material, and in this case, it's an isotope of nickel, that material that we have everywhere on the planet. Specifically, nickel-56 that has a half-life of roughly around 6 days. Which means that pretty much all of it is going to be completely gone within only a month. But within the first few days, the burning itself produces a lot of light, a lot of energy, and all of the nickel is then converted into cobalt and iron. But in this case, something was slowing down the nickel reaction, and eventually the nickel reaction was much much stronger than in any other supernova, because the total brightness was also much much larger. This of course created a bit of a mystery for the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description, but it looks like they may have resolved it. And what they realized is that because the supernova occurred inside of a star, or inside of an AGB star, the materials surrounding that star were probably at first preventing the reaction from happening, but after some time, the supernova itself gave enough energy to the material around it to ignite it as well, creating the very very bright, very large explosion, even larger and even more brighter. And one of the telltale signs of this happening is actually in how it then decreases brightness like a typical supernova would. In other words, the end of this was very very typical and ended up producing what usually is being produced in supernova, which is carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide here serves as a kind of a coolant and actually cools down the reaction itself, and it was of course detected by the scientists studying this event. But the reason why it took so long for this supernova to become very bright is most likely because the nickel itself was being hidden by all of the extra layers of the previous star. And the total brightness can easily be explained by all of the other materials that were ignited as the supernova started reaching outer layers of the star and, well, basically destroyed everything in the vicinity. Now this of course is the first supernova we've ever seen happening inside another star, and this is probably going to be the only one for a while, but because this event was the first time we've ever seen a supernova happening inside another star, or well technically inside an almost planetary nebula, this of course means that it's probably a somewhat rare event. Which also means that maybe for now at least, the so-called space candles can still be used as measurements of distances. On the other hand, Finding more such events will give us an idea of how frequent this happens, and how likely we are to discover something else incredible sometime in the future. But then again, a lot of stars are actually binary stars, at least half of the stars in our galaxy are binary stars, and many of these stars will actually produce two white dwarfs like we've seen here. Like the nearby Alpha Centauri system is one such system. One has already become a white dwarf, the other will slowly turn into the AGB with time, and potentially might attract the partner, thus creating another similar supernova as well. Now, all of this will happen billions of years in the future, of course, but there is a chance that it might happen with a star that's currently on our doorsteps, although by the time it happens, it's probably going to be really, really far away from us. But just the fact that a supernova can even happen inside a star, that's actually kind of cool. It's definitely not something we expect a typical supernova to do. Although for now, that's unfortunately all we know about this particular event. You can find out more details in the paper in the description below. And for now, well, 
that's all I wanted to mention, so thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel either on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that I'm also wearing right now as well. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.